Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, I'm sure that you are keenly aware of the situation in my district with Fitzpatrick and the fact that the impending uh, closure of Fitzpatrick will cost the community 615 <clears throat> jobs. Those 615 jobs, the number alone, um, is going to be a huge devastating blow to the community. But those jobs are $100,000 jobs, which are few and far between in my district. Uh, along with that, they pay uh, $12.5 million in property taxes to Mexico School, which is 49% of their budget, and also another $4.8 million in county and uh, town taxes. So with the impending uh, closure, it's going to be a huge, uh, devastating hit to the community. Uh, I certainly appreciate the fact that the governor has put forward his clean energy standard, uh, something that um, it, it looks to help the nuclear uh, plants, um, not only in, in my district, uh, Fitzpatrick, uh, you know, that's something that's a grave concern that we're trying to turn around, but also have Nine Mile 1 and 2, and we also have an issue pending with Gene that's just outside my district. So my question is, given the, the timeline that we have and how critical the situation is, how quickly um, do you plan to move on this and when do you believe uh, the companies will be able to see a real return, um, possibly to change the direction that uh, Fitzpatrick is going? Thank you, Senator Ritchie, and, and certainly I share your concern, and as you're aware, the governor also shares your concern about the premature closure of the Fitzpatrick unit. Last week, the, as I mentioned, the staff issued the white paper uh, in terms of the proposal of how we would address the financial struggles of the nuclear fleet in the, up, in the upstate region. We will be acting on that. We've already started the process, the review process, and would expect commission action in June of this year, and that allows us to go through our normal regulatory process. Given the fact that the plant uh, is not anticipating closure until next December, this will give Fitzpatrick sufficient time to review what was going on and make preparations, I believe, to stay open. During, during my conversations with the company, uh, their concerns were that they're afraid that this will be drawn out um, far too long. They're not sure it will actually go into into place. So I guess my question would be, do you see yourself um, submitting a proposal to be included in the 30-day amendments for the governor's budget? Well, we, this is not something that we would require a budget amendment for. However, um, if the company is concerned about the process and, and we've talked to them about them, I would request that they really file a petition with us and talk about what their concerns are and what some potential solutions might be available to address their concerns. Since, um, you know, certainly for us, ha this is uh, when a nuclear plant uh, shuts, cannot shut down temporarily. It's a on or off. And so we would hate to think about what could be just a, a month or two month issue as some, um, to be addressed. Is that something that you, that to be a long term problem? for a short, what you can have as a short-term solution. And I would, address, I would request that they come in and talk to us about what their concerns are and how we might address them. Well, given the fact that Gene is not in my district, but the company that owns that nuclear facility also owns two other facilities in my district, and they're going to be in the same type of situation, what is the soonest that you foresee these standards um, being in effect so that companies who are making their decisions will know that um, these credits are forthcoming. Yes, as requested by the governor in his letter to me of December 2nd, we are putting this on really an expedited time frame, and we expect to have resolution by June, which will be sufficient for Gene as well as the Nine Mile 1 and Nine Mile 2 units, and I think also sufficient for Fitzpatrick to be able to react. And just one last question, would it not um, be prudent or would it not show these companies that definitely something is going into effect if they were included in the 30-day amendments and then in the final proposal? Again, this is, um, this clean energy standard is a regulatory process and even if they were in the amendments, I believe we would have to act and, and the six months, I believe, is, is really a fast time for them to be able to have the certainty they need. And again, um, if Fitzpatrick, if the Entergy has concerns, 
we would certainly invite them to come in and let us know what their concerns are and we could start addressing them. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Ritchie. Thank you. Assemblyman Oaks. Hi, Chair. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I want to continue on the, the process that we've just been. I represent the area where the Ganae plan is along with Senator Nazolio and just uh, west of the area of, of Fitzpatrick. So nuclear uh, certainly is, is of significant concern. I, I do appreciate uh, the fact that uh, I know the governor put out to say by June to have the rules. The fact I do sense the uh, uh, expediting or, or giving signals to the industry, uh, certainly that uh, by including it in the, uh, uh, in the clean energy goals, uh, certainly, it, it, the appearance and the focus is showing uh, that there is a, we will have some changes uh, coming down the, uh, uh, down the path. But I do share Senator Ritchie's concerns on the, the timeliness uh, so that they have clear uh, signals and understanding of what uh, the changes uh, are going to be. Um, I, I guess I would just ask uh, a couple other questions and follow up uh, to Senator Ritchie's um, uh, comments. Um, do you see now nuclear having uh, a role in benefiting from the uh, $5 billion clean energy fund? Is that some of what might you know, have access to now being a part of the clean energy plan? Uh, so, uh, thank you, Senator Oaks. Uh, no, I do not. The clean energy fund is really focused on energy efficiency and renewable energy. But the clean energy standard, which is really going to provide nuclear owners as essentially a, a, a supplemental payment mechanism so that they can cover their cost of operating the units, is really in itself a very unique uh, approach. And, and New York is really leading the nation in thinking about how do we address nuclear in this area where we're concerned about climate change. And nuclear does provide zero emission energy. But because of low energy prices, these plants have now become uneconomic in the upstate region. Having this approach where they can have the certitude that they will ha be able to meet their costs going forward is really the focus of the clean energy standard. And as you saw in, I believe, in some Exelon's response, they, they are also believe that this could be a good result for them. I, I do know in the governor's letter that he did in, in December to the PSC talking about uh, how to, he was viewing nuclear and upstate nuclear. Um, talked about if we should lose it, it would really set us back. And uh, I know I've seen some figures that would suggest if Gane and or, and or Fitzpatrick go off, that a decade of renewables where we've come would be the effectiveness of that would be lost uh, and in essence put us back. And, and obviously we're making greater progress today than we were a decade ago. But when you think of where we've come from, uh, to lose either of those in clean energy would uh, certainly uh, hurt uh, significantly. It, one last question. Um, do you see nuclear uh, as being a part of the clean energy economy as, as we uh, discuss it? Assemblyman Lehman Oaks, uh, thank you for the question. I think as we see it, nuclear re is an important part of the fuel diversity that we think is an important part of the energy economy in New York. It certainly is a, a zero emission resource. Um, and when it's safe and it's in, its li in, in its license period, it, it provides important energy, baseload energy for the region. And one of the things that we are concerned with as, at the Public Utilities Commission is having fuel diversity. We have in New York a good mix of resources with, with hydro as well as with uh, uh, solar and wind and, and nuclear. And we want to maintain a good mix of resources that are both clean and allow us to manage uh, price volatility. So nuclear 
fits into this mix, which is why we believe it's important that we have a rational and, and reasonable transition towards the, to the end of the license plans of these units. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go next. Um, so, Chairwoman, thank you so much again for being here today and uh, certainly appreciate all the attention you have given to repowering the energy plant in Dunkirk. You know how crucial that is to that community, not only from the job standpoint, and unfortunately it's mothballed right now, and we know why, and not going to go into um, all the uh, dynamics, but at the same time, the tax base for the community, the uh, opportunity for economic <coughs> growth in the future, and you've heard just two of my colleagues so far talk about the major problem that we see in the state with uh, our power generators across the state, all the way from Long Island up to western New York, whether it's Dunkirk, whether it's Huntley, Somerset, but there's so many plants that are in trouble right now, which raises a lot of concerns on a lot of levels, obviously. Um, number one is that the governor has spoken so eloquently about regrowing the economy in New York State, he has a strong focus on manufacturing, manufacturing jobs. And what that means in Western New York, but across the entire state, is that we cannot lose our ability to generate power. To, if we lose these base load plants, I think that that dooms us in the future in order so that we, it dooms us in the future so that we have less opportunity to grow those manufacturing jobs and bring that prosperity and opportunity to the people of New York State. So. You know, there seems to be, um, in, on some levels, this focus on um, restructuring things so that our plants may be going out of business, whether it's Fitzpatrick and we know the dynamics there. But as we lose these plants, and there's more of a focus on transmission and possible transmission from other states, um, I have concerns about that uh, for many reasons. It just came to my attention this morning. I got an email, and INDEC, which is a small plant, as you know, in Olean, hasn't run since January 4th, it's my understanding. And that pretty much coincides with the major uh, transmission project that was just completed by National Grid that actually ties into Pennsylvania. And as you know, we've had discussions about concerns about the fact that we could be importing power, and oftentimes, well, I know for a fact, other states surrounding us do not have the same uh, standards that we have in New York as far as power generation. So one of the questions that I had, um, does the PSE, New York State, the ISO, do they track levels and sources of imported power, and is this information available to the legislature and the public? Senator Young, uh, thank you for the question and also thank you for your leadership with respect to Dunkirk and the work we're, we're doing there. And yes, the New York ISO uh, does monitor imports and exports of energy as part of its regular business because in order to keep the grid reliable, we need to know what's, in, what's being imported and what's being exported. So that information is there and I'm sure I can check with my colleagues with the New York ISO and we can make that available to you in a plain English form. Right, and that would be helpful. I know it changes, uh, I believe, from day to day just based on power flows and needs and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, my concern is, for example, Pennsylvania still has some of the dirtiest coal plants operating in the country, and we have a different playing field for New York power generators versus power, generation, power generators from other states. And as you know, um, there's no policy of imposing, assessing charges, you know, reggie charges on production of greenhouse gases on power imported from other states, but we impose those on our own industries. And I think this creates an unequal, it's not a level playing field, which uh, obviously uh, brings up some concerns. Um, I wanted to ask about, is the governor committed to providing comparable incentives for renewable sources, or are some renewable sources given more weight than others in helping us reach a clean energy future? So, you know, obviously that's a laudable goal to move forward with the clean energy, but I was wondering, are there some, are, are some more profitable than others in the governor's mind? Senator Young, thank you for the question. 
The way uh, the staff pro is proposing in the clean energy standard, there will be uh, essentially two types of price payments for renewables. For new renewables, there will be one price payment to attract new renewables in the mix, and then there will be a second price payment for existing renewables because we won't want to lose them and have them export in their energy into another state. We also recognize, however, that there are going to be certain types of renewables that we want to get developed in this state, and that the renewable payment that we have through the clean energy standard may not be sufficient. In that instance, it is our expectation that we would support these types of uh, renewables with other programs administered by NYSERDA. A good example of that today is the New York Sun program, where we call it a sort of a form of a co-incentive, where we're, we're explicitly supporting uh, solar development. And uh, the expectation would be as we move forward, if there are particular types of technologies that we want to see developed in the state, but are not, made, are not and, the, and the clean energy standard payment is insufficient, that is where we would expect Green Bank and, and NYSERDA through its programs to help that. Thank you for that. Um, how much is New York incentivizing renewable sources at present, and what is the projection for the next five years? Well, as I mentioned, we've uh, uh, just put in the $5 billion clean energy fund, and if I can, I, I would uh, ask that John uh, Rhodes actually supplement that question because these are details that I know he's aware of. Would you like me to speak now or hold it for you know what, my um, moment? Actually, I can come back. On, why don't As we do wish. that? I'll come yeah. back to you. Thank you so much. So, you know, just back to the transmission thing, though. Um, you know, one of the concerns I said is the uh, ability to attract jobs and, and investment in the state. And, um, and we see all these plants that are actually jeopardized around the state right now. Would the executive um, support a substantial increase to the Power Facility Disruption Mitigation Fund that was supported by $19 million last year given the major and revolutionary changes that the governor is pushing for through REV and similar programs, and is a change in the statute necessary to clarify what counts as a qualifying facility and community? Because I'm, I'm not sure if that's clear right now. Um, Senator Young, we are certainly working right now on the guidelines for the fund that was put in place last year. And I, I really can't speak to whether or not the governor would consider an increase of that fund. Certainly, we thought it would is sufficient, but it's something we can come back to you on. Right. Well, thank you for that. Um, so, I guess uh, you know. Again, I know you're working diligently on all the issues that are arising with the power generators across the state, and I thank you for that. Um, but. Just if we, we could always keep in mind the fact that there are jobs involved, there are communities involved. Um, it is devastating to these communities to lose these power plants. And uh, so we just, uh, I want to thank you for all that you've done for NRG, sincerely. Um, we've made great progress. We still have to get it all the way. Um, but, uh, you know, I appreciate your responses. Thank you. Assemblywoman Russell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Chairwoman Zabelman. Did I say that right? For being here today. Um, I wanted to um, just start off a little bit with your comments on broadband. Um, you know, I, I think that there might have been a missed opportunity in the merger discussions and agreement with Time Warner Cable and Charter, and that more wasn't done to ensure that areas that don't have broadband coverage. Um, you know, would essentially get coverage under the terms of the negotiated agreement. And as you are uh, looking forward to a review of another merger, it, it appears, um, you know, there's a finite amount of resources to address kind of the coverage area of Time Warner Cable, which is upstate. And so it would be nice if the missed opportunity wasn't missed in the downstate area, particularly because there's also uh, more of a, a density um, you know, in favor of service coverage in, in the more urban areas covered by uh, cable vision, um, that we are able to preserve that precious amount of state funding to extend broadband throughout underserved upstate communities. Uh, so that would be much appreciated. Um, under the 
clean, the 10 year clean energy fund. I was wondering if you could tell me, are we treating um, generators and legacy generators the same as potentially new generation projects? Um, I'm particularly wondering about existing hydro facilities. I have a lot of hydro in my district. Thank you, Assemblywoman Russell. Um, under the clean, it's really the clean energy standard that would apply okay. here, and that's okay. We're full of acronyms and names. But under the clean energy standard, what, what the staff has proposed is that there will be, with respect to renewable energy, two tiers of payments. One would with respect to new renewables and second with existing. And then what will happen is that all retailers in the state will have to acquire a certain amount of new, uh, pay for a certain amount of new renewables and existing renewables through this, through this, this what we call renewable energy credit program. Okay. And so consequently, this will, one of the things that our concern is, is that as we're sit hitting a 50% mandate, we want certainly to preserve the existing renewables to stay in the state rather than exporting their energy to other states. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, I'd also like to talk a little bit about um, the executive's um, proposes legislation to adjust the process to review and approve municipally owned gas and electric utility service rate cases. Can you please describe what changes are proposed and why they are necessary? And would the changes result in a savings to the Public Service Commission? Thank you, and thank you for the question. Yes, it will. The proposal is, is that we exempt these small municipal utilities from the evidentiary portion of hearings and allow for more expedited review. The rate case process is obviously a complicated process. We've experienced staff. We often find that with these municipal utilities, we're, we settle, and anything we can do to expedite that process really helps the municipals and ends up helping customers because it takes costs out of the process of setting rates. Yeah, I, I figured the cost savings would probably be more on the small couple of hundred customer utility versus the Public Service Commission's workload because it probably represents a very small portion of your rate cases. It, it, it will help with our cases. You know, we have, uh, we continue to look like other, the other agencies to find lean ways to do business, to not do things that we find are, are, no, long, you know, are no longer in the interest of uh, consumers. And this is one that we identified as could be helpful for the municipals as well as helpful for staff. Um, the evidentiary hearing requirement would be eliminated for some municipal utility rate cases, uh, correct? That's correct. And why does the commission believe that would be useful? You've kind of answered it in your previous testimony, but. Um. I think it's useful because many of these cases end up not going to hearing, they get settled, and it'll allow us to expedite the review and, and really get to a point where we can set rates. Uh, municipals, unlike, for example, investor-owned utilities, do not have shareholders. And really, it's just a question of setting the right cost level. We, and there's not this kind of the concern that folks have in terms of whether or not there's unfair profit making going on. Will there still be a process, though, for these? There, uh, there will still exempt? be. A, yes, sorry. Go ahead. There will still be a process. We'll still have it. Uh, it'll still be a transparent process, and constituents mm -hmm. will be aware of it. It really just eliminates the evidentiary portion of the case. And just the trials. Full in full disclosure, I was raised in a muni, and I live in a neighboring muni, so. Um, in case anybody wants to know if I have a conflict. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Senator Betty Little. I don't think so. uh, thank you very much, Chairman Zabelman, for being here. And I'd like to direct my questions to uh, the governor's proposal to reach a 30 percent in renewable energy. Um, I have a lot of wind and I have a lot of solar in my district, and they do get a lot of subsidies. But the one thing I have that I think is one of the um, cleanest uh, renewables is hydro. And many of my hydro plants are small, although I have some large ones as well. And I actually have 20 small hydro plants in my district. But they have a really tough time. Right now they're getting one and a half, one and a half cents for their electricity, and it's costing them three cents to produce it. So. They have to depend upon a day ahead market rate. And like biomass, they also have to get into a maintenance tier to try to get their pricing. What can we do to help these? Thank you, Senator Little. And um, 
I'm well aware of the issue that's, that's confronting the hydro plants. Quite frankly, uh, um, this entire discussion around generation centers on the fact that we have historic low natural gas prices in the region, and that is driving the historically low energy prices. And so many plants are suffering from the fact that there's simply not enough revenues in the market for them to uh, maintain. So one of the things that, again, we look to do with the clean energy standard is to have a supplemental payment stream for existing renewables, including existing hydro, recognizing that with the mandate, we certainly don't want those plants to retire and then no. have to replace those kilowatts or megawatts with new renewables that will be more expensive. So, ha so we want to have two tiers of payments, but they, we want to make sure that certainly we're not asking consumers to pay more than necessary, but with that we're giving these resources sufficient funds so that they can continue to operate in the state. And the concern would be is if they're insufficient, then there would be an incentive to say, well, then let's sell our output into Massachusetts or Connecticut or Vermont, and that doesn't help us either. So that's, that's why we crafted in the clean energy standard these two tiers of payments for existing and new. That's true. Some of our wind is going to Vermont already in the North Country because the transmission lines really aren't, the grid is not big enough to bring a lot of it down. But you would hate to see these uh, hydro plants just fall into disrepair and sit there. People right. have a lot of money invested in them. So, and, and, yes, yeah. Is there a, a better way for them to get funded and to bid on their, other than going with the day ahead market and the maintenance tiers and that? Well, what we hope is, is that the clean energy standard, which will provide them a supplemental payment stream, will replace the maintenance tier. And so the combination of what they make in the energy market and the supplemental payment made through the clean energy standard will be sufficient for them to maintain, operation, maintain operations. And they could apply for that. They would apply, they would bid, Frank, what will happen is NYSERDA will administer an auction process and they will bid in what they will need in order to be able to sustain operations in the state. And that will help us <coughs> set the level of the supplement. Okay. Well, thank you very much, but it is a big concern and that uh, certainly, you know, one thing we have in the North Country is a lot of mountains and a lot of water. So mm -hmm. this is important. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblyman Lopez. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, Chairwoman, just uh, just want to clarify, and, and maybe you could help me uh, a little get up to speed. I know you've been, your agency's been uh, directly involved with the energy highway rollout, and one of the issues has been uh, the issue of trying to, to Move, move the uh, potential investors uh, to stay within existing utility rights of way. And I'm, I'm just curious, uh, in terms of your, your mission statewide, is there any learning curve or anything for, for future uh, expansion of, of, of the grid and lines in particular? Is there an effort to try to stay within rights of way? Is there any change in regulatory policy through PSC? Yes, so, so one of the, um, for longstanding um, policy of the, of the PSC through the article citing process, we always look at minimizing environmental impact, including land act impact of transmission. However, the, the, the importance of uh, thinking about how we can, how we minimize land impact was certainly emphasized by Governor Cuomo two years ago when he asked us to develop rules to fast track, if you will, transmission that stays within existing right of way. The uh, AC transmission line, which I think of is we recently moved forward to the New York ISO for consideration, has we've been able to, through that the process, identified a way to get uh, a significant amount of uh, trans uh, bill transmission built and staying within existing right of way, which will also help the upstate plants because now they can sell into the more expensive market to, in downstate. Thank you. Uh, secondly, in 2014, New York State consumers experienced a horrendous spike in, in energy prices. And we understand the cause and effect, but as I researched this with utility spokespersons and others, there seemed to be no real safeguard in place uh, to prevent this from happening again. And I'm just curious, what, what has PSC done uh, since that time to protect against future price spikes? 